Hey cats and kittens, I'm Elise. It's nice to see you here today. Don't know me yet, I run Bookishly by E, which is a Facebook page, um, a Instagram, TikTok, and like a bunch of other stuff. I'm all over the place. I do things sometimes when I remember to. Uh, I'm best known for loving books and my colorful hair and makeup and fabulous jewelry. So there's my shameless plug for myself and we'll move on. <laughs> Today, I am going to be reading for you the first chapter, A Love Story by Jay Bankson. I hope I said that right. I really, really hope so. If I didn't, I'm so sorry. I really try hard with names, but I'm not always good at it. So here's the deal. You can get this book on Kindle Unlimited. Here, let me pull it up here real quick so I can give you all the deets. So on Kindle Unlimited, you can read it for free. And if you want to buy it outright, you can get it for $4.99. You can also get it on paperback for $17.49. And even better, you can get it on Audible. Uh, on Audible, you can get it for um, your one credit or you can buy it outright there too. And on Audible, it is narrated by Andy Arndt and Joe Arden. Um, I've actually listened to books by them before and they're both really good. So, um, I'm just doing the first chapter. If you want the audio, you know where to get it on Audible, which I highly recommend. At the end of the video, I'll give you all the details on how you can connect with our author because she has a Facebook page, a group, which I can tell you right now, I kind of want to join the group just because she named the group the banana binder, <laughs> which that already sounds like a win. I don't know about you. So she has a group. She's on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So there are lots of ways that you can connect with her when you decide you love this book, because obviously you're going to. I've only read the first chapter so far and I already love it. Like it's already good. Like the, the heroine is like sassy and like, I get that. I'm like, yes, I relate. Um, and also, please remember, after you're done with the book and discussing it here and having such a fun time reading it, please remember to leave a review because reviews are awesome. Super helpful to our authors always. Chapter one, Casey, the beginning. On the morning of May 30th, 2014, I was just a 23-year-old accounting student at Arizona State University, enjoying the first weeks of summer break. On the side, I served up Bloomin' Onions as a waitress at Outback Steakhouse. I was a reasonably attractive 20-something girl with a quick wit and an easy smile. Really, there was nothing special about me. At least nothing special enough to predict that when I woke up that morning, life as I knew it would never be the same. As the youngest of three rowdy kids in a loud, boisterous, middle-class family, and the only girl, I had been a seriously rough and tumble tomboy. When I was young, my best friends were boys, and it wasn't unusual for me to spend hours outside riding bikes, bouncing a basketball, or climbing trees. But then, much to my dismay, puberty set in at the age of 13, and my scrawny little body started changing. I fought it for a while, not ready to give up my happy life as one of the boys. However, as my breasts formed and my legs lengthened and my hips shaped curves into my previously stick thin frame, my friends started noticing. Everything changed. The boys looked at me differently. They whispered behind my back. They tried grabbing me in places I definitely did not want to be grabbed. Gradually, I stopped running around with the boys and found myself a group of nice, smart girls who were in my honors classes. Now, they weren't as fun as the boys, but at least they weren't acting like horny little perverts. Seeing as I was friendly with the smart kids, it goes without saying, I was not among the popular crowd. Still, I had plenty of friends, and among the misfits I hung with, I was considered pretty hot stuff. I even sometimes caught the eye of boys from the in crowd. Some of the common compliments I would receive from them were, you're kind of pretty for a smart girl, or you'd be hot if you didn't talk so much. Hey, in high school, you take what you can get. It wasn't until midway through my junior year in high school that the hormones really kicked in, and all of a sudden, I was boy crazy. 
Once that happened, I started dressing nice, wearing makeup, and actually brushing my hair instead of just pulling it into a ponytail. I tried to play it cool when a boy took interest in me, but all I knew about the opposite sex came from my two caveman brothers and the boys I'd played with for years. Potential suitors, I quickly discovered, did not particularly appreciate me making inappropriate jokes about their private parts. Only one boy was brave enough to take me on, Tommy Schultz. We started dating midway through my senior year. Like me, he was one of the cooler smart kids. Tommy actually liked my sense of humor and thought I was fun. Together, we experienced all the epic senior moments, senior picnic, senior trip, prom, and sex. He was my first and I was in love. My immature brain really believed we'd be together forever. But the day after graduation, he abruptly dumped me explaining that he didn't want to be tied down his freshman year in college. I was heartbroken. He never looked back. So off I went to college with a freshly broken heart. Even though I'd grown up only a few miles from ASU, my parents wanted me to have the full college experience and allowed me to live in the dorms my freshman year. It turned out to be exactly what I needed to really grow and mature and have a little fun in the process. In hindsight, I had to thank my former boyfriend. He'd been right. College was a hell of a lot more fun without him there too. Luckily, the enormous student body afforded me the opportunity to start out with a completely clean slate. No one knew me as Tomboy Casey or Talks Too Much Casey. In college, I was just Casey, a girl with decent curves, cute dimples, a flowing mane of brunette hair, and what I had been told was an infectious personality. Yes, there were definitely times when I could turn off a guy's interest with a simple, ill-placed snort of laughter or badly timed dick joke. But for the most part, I'd managed to reinvent myself into a somewhat polished young woman. Even if at times I had to rein in my raunchy sense of humor to appease the boys, the trade-off was usually worth it. Although I dated guys here and there, I didn't have another boyfriend until my sophomore year in college. Logan Adams was the son of a wealthy businessman and the backup for the backup quarterback on the ASU football team. Logan was handsome, rich, and cocky as hell. Warning bells were going off in my head before he ever even opened his mouth. But, as many girls do, I overlooked his obvious flaws because he was so damn hot. And he did win me over with what I thought was his kind, sensitive side. Turned out there was nothing warm or fuzzy about him. It took me over a year to figure out that my boyfriend had a passion for sleeping with girls other than me. After him, my love life was... Well, non-existent. I was unattached and definitely not looking. There was a certain satisfaction in being single. I could do what I wanted, whatever I wanted. My main focus was not on finding a guy. It was to graduate on time the following spring. I was already on the five-year plan due to my work schedule and the difficulty in getting the classes I needed. No way was I going to make it six. And although I had a part-time job to help pay for my expensive tuition, my parents had sacrificed a lot to send me to college on their fixed income. I felt a strong sense of responsibility to really buckle down this year and get my degree completed. Love would have to wait. And when it was time, I now knew the type of guy not to look for. Really, I wasn't that picky. Personality was way more important to me than looks. Although if the guy were also hot, I'd consider that an added bonus. The older I got, the more I realized I shouldn't have to dumb it down or clean it up in order to impress a guy. Either I was good enough as I was, or he wasn't worth my time. I knew my man was out there somewhere. I just never, in a million years, could have predicted who he would be. Kate Mullen was a good friend of mine. We met as waitresses at Outback and stayed friends even after she left. We shared a quirky sense of humor and a love for reality TV. 
I'd known Kate for two years when she asked me to be a bridesmaid at her wedding. I was thrilled to be part of her special day. At lunch, a couple of weeks before the ceremony, Kate dropped the bomb on me. Mitch thinks it would be best to pair you up with Jake. Her words didn't immediately register with me. Wait, what? I asked. We're going to partner you and Jake up for the wedding, Kate repeated. Then I understood, and my stomach dropped. Holy crap. She meant the rock star. I'd known Jake McAllister would be there. He was, after all, the groom's brother, but I just assumed I would be admiring from afar. But I thought Sarah was going to be his partner, I sputtered. That's all she's talked about for the past four months. I know. I love Sarah, but sometimes she comes on too strong. Sometimes, I joked. Remember Aaron? Oh, God. Kate rolled her eyes and laughed. <laughs> yeah, that was bad. I was going to tell her he was gay, but it was just too much fun to watch. <laughs> You're awful, Kate proclaimed, shaking her head. Anyway, Mitch is worried that Sarah will be all over Jake and that she might make him feel uncomfortable. Jake doesn't like fawning. And you think I won't fawn all over him? I replied in a raised voice. It's not your style, Casey. Have you seen the boy? Yes, Kate affirmed. I have seen him. Then you understand that you're giving me way too much credit, right? Kate nodded her head, laughing. I mean, I've never met anyone famous before. Not to mention gorgeous famous. There's no telling what I might do to that poor boy, I claimed, only half joking. And if you do, I'm sure he'd be happy about it. I gasped like I was offended, which I wasn't. The reality was I'd never be bold enough to hit on a guy like Jake. So such a scenario was absurd. Mitch just wants him to feel comfortable at the wedding. If Jake wants to get laid, that's his business. We just aren't going to facilitate it. Right, because the last thing you want is all eyes on the hot singer and his busty blonde. Yeah, for sure, Kate agreed. Look, Casey, if you really don't want to partner with him, I'll talk to Mitch and we'll find someone, uh, someone more deserving of spending the evening with a famous smoking hot rock star, okay? Well, now, hold on there, Missy. Let's not be hasty, I replied, a sly smile spreading across my face. I didn't say I wasn't interested. I'm just conveying to you that the idea of it scares the crap out of me. But yeah, I can suck it up for one night. Take one for the team. I mean, it's your wedding, and that's the type of person I am. Selfless. Uh... Yes, you are an amazing human being. Thank you for your sacrifice, Casey. Kate responded in mock seriousness. I nodded stoically as if I were doing Kate a huge favor and then gasped after realizing the implications of pairing with Jake. Oh God, Sarah's going to be so mad. Kate cringed. I haven't figured out how I'm going to tell her yet. She'll never forgive you. It's like she called dibs on Jake the moment you announced your wedding. I know. Sarah's still going to go after him. I hope Mitch realizes that. Yeah, he does. But at least Jake won't feel obligated to hang out with her the entire time. That's true. Does Sarah even know if Jake is single? Isn't he dating that pop star? That was a while ago. I don't think they're still together, Kate said. That doesn't mean he doesn't have a new girl. I mean, all this effort Sarah is putting into nailing a rock star, and it could all be for naught. It just seems such a shame. You be nice, Casey. Sarah will be mad enough as it is, and I don't think Jake has a girlfriend. He didn't ask for a plus one for the wedding, so I'm just assuming he's single. Single but banging the groupies, I sang out. Casey, God, you can be so crude sometimes. Kate grimaced as she tried to suppress a smile. That's why you love me, I declared. Yeah, you're right. I guess I should tone it down for Jake. He probably won't appreciate my raunchy personality as much as you do. I don't know about that. He does have four brothers. True, but I heard he isn't, uh, 
how do I put this nicely? The most interactive guy? Where did you hear that? Like, everywhere, duh. Well, don't believe everything you hear or read about him in the media. Mitch says Jake gets a bad rap and that he's actually a pretty well-adjusted guy. Seriously? That's what I'm told, Kate affirmed, putting her hands up. But then, what do I know? The first time I'll meet the other half of Mitch's family will be on our wedding day. I could hear the annoyance in her voice and knew this was an issue for her. In the two years they'd been dating, Mitch had yet to take Kate to California to introduce her to his father, stepmother, and half-siblings. Mitch's mom and dad had never married and split while he was still a baby. Growing up, Mitch had lived primarily with his mother in Arizona and only visited his dad and half-siblings in California on assorted holidays and during the summer months. When Kate first told me she was dating Kate McAllister's half-brother, I assumed she'd already met Jake. But the reality was, Jake and Mitch weren't close. They shared a father, but not much else. Their relationship was more like that of distant cousins. They didn't dislike each other, they just lived their own lives and knew very little about one another. Kate had told me that Mitch was surprised Jake was even coming at all. Don't you worry, I replied to my obviously distressed friend. I'll take care of our handsome musician. If there's any fun in that gorgeous body of his, I'll do my best to bring it out of him. There's the Casey I know and love. After the initial shock wore off, nervous excitement set in. All week before the wedding, I worried that Jake and I would have absolutely nothing in common. Nothing to talk about. I had zero experience with guys like him. I'd never been the type of girl who went for the bad boy tattooed rocker types. Although I had to admit my current dating pool, the clean cut jock or the self-important intellectual had not yielded the best results either. Regardless, what was I going to say to a guy like him? Jake McAllister might have been a rock star, but he was no ordinary one. His road to the top had been brutal. Jake became famous as a child, but not for his musical aptitude. In fact, he became famous for something entirely not of his doing. At 13 years of age, Jake McAllister had been the victim of a stranger abduction. The violent kidnapping, which was witnessed by his traumatized younger brother, struck a nerve with the American public. His disappearance and the subsequent search efforts played out over television sets across the nation. Incredibly, Jake had managed to survive over a month in captivity before making a shocking escape, which ended with the stabbing death of the very man who had kidnapped him. Police immediately declared the killing self-defense and refused to provide any further comment. Then, presumably in an effort to protect the privacy of a minor, the court system sealed all documents relating to Jake McAllister's kidnapping. Although no specifics had ever been released to the public, that didn't stop the media from speculating on every tiny detail. The general consensus about the kidnapping was that Jake had been horribly abused during his time in captivity and that had he not killed his abductor, he would not be alive today. That became especially telling when the kidnapper's DNA linked him to several other missing and murdered boys. Jake had not survived just a stranger abduction, but a serial killer. The sensational story lit up the news channels and printing presses for months. The media hounded Jake. He couldn't step foot outside his door without cameras in his face. I couldn't imagine what it must have been like for him to survive what he had and then to be treated so harshly by the media. As with all big news stories, Jake's eventually faded from the headlines and he presumably went on to lead a private life. But as it turned out, that was not the end of his story. Jake resurfaced a few years later as a solo rock musician and was almost immediately catapulted into superstardom. He was hailed as a musical prodigy and truly his talents were undeniable. With his soaring rock anthems and haunting ballads and his knack for writing one mega hit song after another, Jake was arguably the world's most famous rock star. Yet, despite all his success, Jake was a bit of an enigma. He lived a giant life, but little was known about him privately. Aside from work-related appearances, Jake was rarely spotted out in public. 
He didn't frequent typical celebrity establishments, seldom appeared on television, and steadfastly refused all interviews, much to the dismay of the collective media worldwide. Really, though, who could blame him for snubbing the media after how they treated him as a child? Jake's silence only seemed to fuel the fire of mystery surrounding him. Rumors swirled. Reports of him being homicidal, antisocial, suicidal, or a drug addict were front page fodder for the trash magazines. And without Jake telling his side of the story, that was the version most people believed. To be fair, the handful of times I'd seen Jake on TV, he'd seemed like a fairly personable guy. He smiled and interacted like any other person would. And when he performed, Jake was really engaging and energetic. I'd always wondered if maybe Jake wasn't the recluse he was portrayed to be. Maybe he just liked his privacy. Plenty of people had survived traumatic childhoods and had turned out to be perfectly normal adults. I mean, talent and looks alone couldn't have gotten Jake to where he was today, not without at least some social skills. Besides, getting up on stage in front of thousands of people, that took tenacity and resolve, certainly not common traits found among deranged homicidal loners. No, it wasn't so much Jake I was worried about, but myself. I always turn into a blabbering idiot when I was around reserved people. There was always that need to fill in the blanks. I can almost picture the look on the poor guy's face when I started jabbering on endlessly about trivial stuff. He was going to think I was such a weirdo. And that's the end of chapter one. So I hope that you enjoyed that and are looking forward to chapter two. I mean, I am already. Like, this is very promising already. So if you want to find Jay Banks, Bankson, Jay Banks, I can't say it. I'm so sorry. Jay Bankson. I think I got it that time. If you want to find her, you can find her on Instagram at J dot underscore B E N G T S S O N on Facebook at J Bankson author or on Twitter at cake, a love story. All pretty easy to keep track of. Right. And like I said, you can find her group. Uh, let me make sure that I have like the full name here. The full name is J Bankson's the banana binder. And it has over 2000 members. So I'm sure that group is like, that's gotta be fun. <laughs> I think I'm probably going to join it just because I like to lurk. Now, remember you can get this on Amazon in paperback. You can buy it for your Kindle. You can also get it on Audible and enjoy some really awesome narration from professional narrators. <laughs> I'm not quite like professional, especially with like my setup right here, right now. Like video is not like my strong suit. <laughs> um, and make sure that you comment on the posts and interact and tell us what you think about the story as you read it. And please, please, please leave a review when you're done with the book, because that's how we support our authors, because we love them so much. And she wrote us an awesome story. I can already tell. So. Enjoy the book. I love you all. I think that's it. <laughs> Awkward time with Elise is now officially over. Okay. Bye. I am here today to bring to you Cake, a love story by Jay Bankston. Sorry, I have cats and they only come alive when I'm recording things because they're little pains in the butts, because they're cats. Okay, so let's dive in. Oh, oh yeah, we're done. I get nervous doing these videos, so I have to make fun of myself a lot. Don't judge me. <laughs> or judge me a lot. <laughs> Probably a lot. Okay. I had plenty of friends, and among them, and among... 
stuff. Hot. I was considered pretty hot stuff. Babe, oil your chair. <laughs> it is so loud. Anyway, try again. <laughs> About him in the media. Mitch says Jake... Mitch... <laughs> Mitch says Jake gets a bad rap. Yeah, on a sol On... Mitch had lived... Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Growing up... That's where I'm going. Growing up...